Thank you, Brian. Well, I did uh, revisit Charles Lawton in all his glory, but I couldn't find a suitable um, clip to illustrate uh, diplomacy. So, um, in fact, it was singularly lacking in anything that might be described as di diplomatic. So, alas, no Charles Lawton this time. The great military historian, Karl von Clausewitz, is best remembered for an aphorism. War is the continuation of politics by other means. International politics was very different in the 16th century from what it is now, but insofar as it existed at all, its context was diplomacy. This was a stage on which great men came in great magnificence, armed with powers to strike huge bargains, and who were treated almost as if they were the prince himself. At face value, it's hard to take Clausewitz's famous one-liner as anything other than pretty cynical. But in the 16th century, it might have seemed slightly less so. True, warfare could be as bloody and horrific then as at any time. But it wasn't always. Henry VIII's wars were mostly about honor, and honor could be as well satisfied with a bloodless outcome as with a pile of corpses. The Battle of the Spurs, so-called because the French turned tail and all the English saw was the backs of their spurs, was ideal because it traded minimal losses for maximum glory. Machiavelli described the young Henry VIII as rich, fierce, and greedy for glory. And when it came to war, glory, coupled without good outcomes, was what mattered most. But whether cheap or costly in human terms, war was always costly in other terms. For it to be glorious, it had to be magnificent. And when Henry uh, embarked on his French campaign in 1513, the Venetian ambassador wrote that the valuables they took with them were incredible. The trappings of the king's charger and the jewels around his headpiece were worth 15,000 crowns. Never had a finer sight been seen, so he says. And the jeweled helmet that he wore at the Westminster tournament two years earlier might give an idea of quite how fine a sight it must have been. Another account describes Henry's tent, the inside of which, and I, I quote, was covered with rich cloth of gold of pure drawn gold thread. There was also a beautiful gilded sideboard of very large vessels and flagons, among them some drinking cups, all of gold. The outside of the tent was likewise, from the ground to the summit, overlaid with good cloth of gold. Well, a hint of this, but only a modest one, can be gleaned from uh, a detail of the King David tapestries in Ecouen, which shows a handsome display of a uh, plate inside the king's campaign tent, and there you can see it. But the costs of such campaigns were huge, and even a king as rich as Henry VIII could not sustain an army in the field for very long. And to turn Clausewitz on his head, diplomacy became an attractive way of pursuing war by other means. For when skillfully done, this was as effective at influencing events as war was, but at significantly lower cost. Diplomacy took two distinct forms. On the one hand, there was the high-profile embassies sent for a specific purpose, and on the other, there was the system, uh, in its uh, infancy in the 16th century, of maintaining permanent diplomatic representation at certain courts. And these two systems were quite different. The special embassies were effectively summit meetings. The ambassadors were some of the greatest in their land. In the case of England, figures like the Duke of Suffolk and Cardinal Wolsey, and were treated, as I've said, as if they were the king himself. As a result, these missions were opulent and involved splendid church services, tournaments, pageants, banquets, and costly gifts. Resident ambassadors, by contrast, were professionals. They enjoyed certain privileges, such as relatively free access to the court, but in other respects, 
they were not very well provided for, either by their hosts or by their masters. And sometimes, frankly, they struggled to keep up appearances. Uh, at the end of their term, they could expect to uh, receive gifts that were really relatively modest. The great embassies were vast undertakings involving large numbers of people, hundreds of horses, and very complicated uh, logistics. Oops, that's, um, that's where I want to be. Uh, the Spanish ambassadors to London in, 16, in, in 1517 were, and I quote from a contemporary source, accompanied by so noble a train of men and horses that had the King of Spain himself come in person, he could not have been more honorably attended. They had with them some 100 horses and 24 baggage wagons. When the uh, French admiral came in 1534, he had 350 horses. And this slide shows part of Henry VIII's vastly bigger entourage uh, in France in 1520. And at the heart of diplomacy were gifts. These were usually presented to departing ambassadors as part of the concluding ceremonies. The preferred material was plate because this was prestigious, easy to value, uh, and equally easy to cash in. Uh, an amusing story from the end of the reign describes what must have been quite common practice. The English ambassador to France, Henry Wootton, wrote of how he sold the plate given to him by Francis I almost immediately after getting it. He judged that it was all second-hand and indeed recognized two of the cups as ones he had himself been given <laughs> on a previous occasion and had sold them straight afterwards. Uh, and, and he goes on to say, since I had them as cheap first as now, I will sell them again, trusting that they love me so well that they will not be long away. <laughs> well, this was well-known practice in the 18th century when the normal currency of diplomatic gifts, when not porcelain, was gold boxes. Uh, but it's interesting to see that it was already well-established practice uh, two centuries earlier. But what could be sold could equally well be passed on to someone else to satisfy an obligation. And in 1513, we read of the recycling of two gold cups previously given by Henry VIII to an Italian cardinal who subsequently presented one of them to the emperor and the other to the doge of Venice. Who knows what they were like? Uh, perhaps something like this. Again, this was probably quite normal, this, this passing on to, to uh, keep things, as it were, in circulation. Ambassadorial gifts were essentially cash in a more socially acceptable form. Unsurprisingly, the scale of the gift tended to reflect the status of its recipient um, and the importance of the delegation. The gifts presented to the French ambassadors in 1518 were typical. Uh, according to the chronicler, Edward Hall, when the time came, the king gave the Admiral of France a garnish of gilt vessel, a pair of uh, covered basins, gilt, 12 great gilt bowls, four pair of great gilt pots, and a standing cup of gold garnished with great pearl. To some others, he also gave plate, to some chains of gold, to some rich apparel, so that every gentleman was well rewarded, which liberality the strangers much praised. An apparently even more munificent gift was given to the departing imperial ambassador in 1522, even though we're not told of its value. He'd been uh, in England to discuss arrangements for his master's impending visit, and he was rewarded accordingly. He wrote to Charles V, that Cardinal Wolsey led me into a room where there were displayed on a buffet about 80 pieces of plate, most of them beautifully gilt, which he presented to me. We can perhaps get a flavor of these wares from an irritatingly cropped detail from the admittedly rather earlier image from the Tre Richeur of the Duc de Berry, where you can, you can see uh, there's just, uh, uh, one can imagine the, the buffet extending some way uh, in off off screen, as it were. The composition of these gifts wasn't always alike. It really didn't matter so long as they were presentable and, as Philippa was uh, pointing out earlier, the weight was right. 
time was often of the essence, and sometimes they had to scrabble around to put together a suitable package in the time available. Such a situation occurred in August uh, 1537, when an urgent and unexpected need arose to um, give plate to the Scottish ambassadors, and Cromwell dispatched his servant, Robert Lord, to go and buy it. The next day, Lord wrote to Cromwell saying, I went today to all the goldsmiths um, of London, except Martin Bowes and Robert Trapps, who were not in town. It seems that none could oblige. So, to continue the quotation, I sent for Trapps 10 miles out of the city, and of him and Robert Latham, I had what your lordship wrote for, as near the value as I could get, as you wished them by tomorrow. Clearly, these things cannot have been custom made, and must have been stock items or, or even second hand. These gifts, normally of silver gilt, were supplied through the office of the jewel house and they were expensive. The plate for the French ambassadors in 1518 cost 1829 pounds and 14 shillings. I'm not going to try and cleverly translate that into modern terms because believe me, it always ends up misleading. Just have to stick with the raw numbers. Um, and at the going rate of five shillings and tuppence per ounce, um, this would have provided some 7,000 ounces of silver gilt, enough for a very handsome display. And interestingly, uh, echoing exactly the number that Philippa was quoting earlier for uh, issues of diplomatic plate uh, in, the, uh, in the 17th century. Uh, yes, 17th, early 18th century. To give you a visual reference for that, um, that would be the equivalent of 35 stacks of Georgian plates like these, or about 100 cups and covers like this. Uh, precedent was always a concern. And when the French Admiral arrived in 1534, Cromwell made a note to himself, reminding himself to find out the gift to be given by the King to the Admiral, and to know the value of the last gift given to the Admiral at Calais. When he left two weeks later, the plate uh, he received was said to amount to a value of 8,000 ducats. Again, all that can hardly have been made in two weeks. On occasions, however, values could be adjusted downwards to send a certain message. In uh, 1533, the Bishop of Paris came to discuss whether Francis would support Henry's position against papal authority. Francis turned out to be rather less cooperative than Henry had hoped, and as a result, the bishop, according to one rumor, had only at his parting half the present the king had first thought of giving him. What did these gifts look like exactly? Well, we don't know for sure, but in all likelihood, the silver would normally have been relatively plain. Uh, rather like this French mid-16th century flagon. The French Admiral's standing cup of gold garnished with great pearl um, that I mentioned a moment ago stands out as a rather uh, more highly ornamented thing, but that would appear to be a, 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 token, um, a, a token, as it were, work of art, um, whereas the others were essentially commodity. Gifts were also exchanged between princes themselves. And we've been talking about this in other lectures over the last couple of days. Uh, and these um, would have been conveyed to their recipient either as part of the mission of one of these great embassies or by specially appointed messengers. These tended, these gifts between princes, tended to be less formulaic than ambassadorial gifts and they were usually strategically motivated. The Marquis of Mantua sent a gift of horses, falcons, and an oriental scimitar, and they appeared to have had the desired effect. Uh, his ambassador, Julie, reporting back to the Marquis uh, in Mantua that the king was so pleased with the present that the Marquis might rely on his support on all occasions. A more transparently strategic gift came from Ferdinand of Aragon, his own father-in-law in 1515. He sent Henry magnificently caparisoned horses and a fabulous sword worth in Cardinal Wolsey's estimation, an extraordinary 100,000 ducats. 
Henry wrote to Ferdinand saying that great as the value of the presents is, he values them principally because they show Ferdinand's love and benevolence towards him. This was diplomatically missing the point, which his wife addressed head on, writing to her father that due to these presents, the treaty with England is concluded and alliances renewed. What you might call compendium presents were occasionally made in order to make a particularly strong point. In 1523, following his state visit to England, Hall records that Charles V sent to the King of England two mules trapped in, that's to say, harnessed, uh, in crimson velvet, curiously embroidered, all the buckles, stirrups, and all such garnishes were of silver and gilt of marvelous cunning work. He sent also, among other things, four spears and two javelins of strange timber and work richly garnished, and five brace of greyhounds. Similarly, in 1529, Francis I sent four mules loaded with most handsome effects, gifts bearing gifts, as it were. We don't have an image of any of these wonderfully caparisoned horses, but um, this detail of Henry's horse from the Westminster tournament roll gives an idea of how rich they probably were. I think it's an absolutely splendid image, that one. The most famously extravagant display of princely magnificence in the whole of the 16th century was the meeting of Francis I and Henry VIII near Calais in uh, 1520, the so-called Field of Cloth of Gold. This was essentially a massive tournament, and it's got its name from the staggering quantities of that most costly of textiles deployed by both the French and the English sides. And here is um, a detail showing um, some of uh, Francis's um, tents. There's uh, Henry and Francis having that rather um, ill-judged uh, wrestling match where um, Henry lost and got rather cross. Um, this three-week jamboree involved some 12,000 people, uh, and it was an endless round of jousts, tourneys, banquets, and church services. And it concluded, predictably, with the exchange of jaw dropping but reciprocal gifts. The difference between gifts among princes and those given to ambassadors was that princes were equals and therefore strict reciprocity was essential. And embarrassment in this respect could be avoided by careful planning, but not when one or other of them decided to make a spontaneous gift. Very bad idea, spontaneous gifts. Early on during the field, Francis made an unscheduled visit to Henry. Henry was taken by surprise and felt obliged to mark the occasion appropriately. So having embraced each other, this is a quotation, having embraced each other, uh, the King of England gave Francis a collar of jewels and pearls of great value, perhaps something rather like this. Now it was Francis's turn to be wrong-footed. Presumably, having nothing else to hand, he gave in exchange to the King of England his gold bracelets studded with jewels of great value. Then, doubting whether the gift was an equivalent for the present he had received, he sent, in addition, six courses, horses uh, of great price. The gifts given by the kings to courtiers at the field, um, who, of course, were not their equals, were extraordinary. Henry gave Bonivet, the French admiral, um, and Cardinal Wolsey's opposite number, jewels and plate worth 14,000 crowns. To the Duke de Bourbon, Constable of France, a jewel cup worth 6,000, and to the Master of the Horse, gold, plate, and jewels worth 2,800. He also gave a present of 2,500 crowns to be distributed amongst the royal household. Gifts were exchanged between courtiers too, and Wolsey, gave Bonivet a very large salt cellar, all of gold, studded with a number of very beautiful jewels and surmounted by uh, a St. George. The best hint of the appearance of this costly object that we can get, to get today is perhaps the 1524 Howard Grace Cup 
uh, in the V&A. It's silver gilt uh, rather than gold, but it's jewel encrusted, and most importantly, it is surmounted by St. George. Of course, none of the field of cloth of gold gifts survives, as far as we know. There was, however, another meeting between the kings, which took place 12 years later in Calais and Boulogne. It was um, less extravagant than the field, but pretty spectacular by any other standards. And from this event, one or possibly two objects do actually survive. Now, it's funny how things go around and come around, isn't it? Uh, and it's always um, particularly uh, disappointing to be sitting in an audience uh, and hear um, a previous speaker completely inadvertently, certainly unintentionally, trash one of the points you're going to make. <laughs> However, we've seen this before, virtually displayed uh, at Ambrath. Um, this cup, uh, nowadays in Vienna, was ordered in Antwerp, supposedly, at least it was my uh, belief and understanding, that it was ordered by Francis for display uh, on his buffet at Boulogne. It's in the very latest style. It was made in 1532, the, the year of the uh, meeting. Uh, and it is an object of extraordinary and astonishing virtuosity. The fact that it wasn't uh, delivered, apparently, to Francis until the following year uh, is, is a slight um, irritant. But there we are. One has to live with facts. Um, the cup is uh, embellished with enamels, pearls, uh, and gemstones. Uh, and it's surmounted by a jeweled standing figure of St. Michael, uh, patron of the French chivalric order. At the end of the meeting, the kings exchanged gifts of diverse precious jewels and great horses. One of the most sensational of Francis's gifts to Henry was a suite of bed furniture wrought throughout with pearls on crimson velvet, which he purchased lately in Paris of an Italian merchant for 10,000 golden crowns. In addition, he made a point of presenting Anne Boleyn, Henry's soon-to-be second wife, uh, on her first official outing with a splendid diamond worth 15 or 16,000 uh, crowns. What happened to Henry's bed or Anne's diamond, we do not know. But it is more than probable that the surviving clock salt in the collection of the Goldsmiths Company came to England at that time as one of the French gifts to Henry or to one of his courtiers. The salt is not marked, but is probably by Francis's goldsmith Pierre Mangot. Uh, and it's exactly the sort of piece that would have been described in the 16th century as a jewel. Although ostensibly a, a functional object, it's a work of art whose aesthetic impact is multi-layered and added to by its pearls and gemstones, its virtuoso techniques, and its sheer complexity. The ornament is all classically inspired, and the carved shell cameo busts themselves allude to ancient Roman busts, as do the terracotta uh, roundels that I ought to be showing you a slide of but forgot, uh, that were commissioned by Wolsey for Hampton Court. Jewel-like, though the clock salt is, uh, it would have appeared even more so at the time. It's not in its uh, completely original state, rather far from it, actually. And it's undergone a number of changes over time. The enamels have deteriorated, and their refined gilded ornament uh, is much faded. It was all, um, it, it, there's traces of gilding, um, decorative gilding, sort of arabesque scrolls and so forth uh, surrounding the, um, the cameos. The uh, finial representing, uh, according to the inventory, Jupiter and Ganymede is lost and was replaced in the late 18th century with a clock face that has also since been removed. The clock mechanism itself uh, inside here uh, is a replacement, and the salt dish, which would have been uh, presumably here, uh, has um, been lost. But it's still a breathtaking object, and it corresponds quite closely to an entry in the 1547 inventory of Henry VIII's possessions. Incidentally, the salt is currently on loan at the British Museum, and you can go and see it there. 
displayed in a special case in the Wadston Bequest Gallery. Um, there it is um, on display. Um, a small commercial, if I may, um, is that it's going to form the subject of a special one-day symposium at Goldsmiths Hall on the 22nd of November with a star-studded uh, list of speakers. So that's a date for your uh, diaries, and it would be lovely to see some of you there. Um, if, if the salt was indeed a gift to Henry, it, it was one carefully calculated to appeal to his taste. Henry clearly had a penchant for complex, multi-purposed objects like this, and it fits within a pattern of gifts exchanged between the two kings over a longer period. Sometime after 1532, uh, that, that second meeting in Boulogne and Calais, the imperial ambassador reported that Francis had sent Henry a very fine and artistic clock on the dial of which the movement of several celestial spheres and planetary systems can be distinctly observed. He can't resist joking that I fancy that if the French ambassador was the inventor of this device, Mars is sure to predominate over Mercury. It's difficult to speculate on the artistic effect of diplomatic gifts when the objects don't survive. But in this case, assuming it really was such a gift, it makes a very clear point, namely that they played an important role in the transference of style from one country to another. Aware that Henry and the English court were of the, uh, uh, aware were, forgive me, aware though Henry and Francis were um, of the, the latest design trends, France was clearly uh, ahead of the game. Francis, through his invasion of northern Italy early in his reign, had direct access to uh, Italian art, whereas Henry had not. He was also more successful in attracting Italian artists to his court. Henry's direct contact with, with uh, French art and design at the field, and through sophisticated gifts such as this, helped to focus artistic patronage and kept the uh, English court in touch with continental developments. Whatever shifts towards Renaissance style were already taking place in England were undoubtedly accelerated as a result of such contacts. Now, nobody would wish to doubt Holbein's genius as an artist or a designer, uh, but it's hard not to see the influence of an object like this in his slightly later design for the Seymour uh, cup made of gold in 1536 to celebrate uh, his marriage uh, with, uh, with Jane Seymour, wife number three. A special category of diplomatic gifts were those from the Pope, Relations between Henry and the papacy were very good for at least the first half of the reign, and a measure of their warmth is the series of gifts that arrived in England up to about 1524. Popes, like other rulers, gave all sorts of gifts, from the hundred Parmesan cheeses that uh, Leo X sent Henry VIII to the magnificent silver, gilt, and rock crystal casket given by uh, Clement VII to Francis when they met in 1538. There it is. Uh, one of the uh, most um, alarming and scary days of my life was when I went to see um, my friend Kirsten Piacenti, who was then director of the Museo degli Argenti in Florence, um, and she got out one or two objects uh, for me to see, uh, and as it turned out, to play with. Um, and when I was expected to play with this, I, I, I felt very, very um, uh, dodgy. Uh, but fortunately, it still looks today much as it did um, then. And um, <laughs> if you, th these are all uh, rock crystal panels that, that are um, engraved in, in bas relief uh, on, on the back. Um, and in case you want to have a closer look at this one, this happens to be uh, a little uh, gilt bronze cast from, from that panel. So you can come and look at that afterwards, um, and it would be nice if it were still there by the time <laughs> the proceedings come to an end. Um, now, where was I? Yes. Um, one object associated with Henry VIII uh, 
may possibly be, possibly be a papal gift, at least in part. This is a rock crystal vase in the church of San Lorenzo in Florence um, that has silver gilt mounts uh, with London hallmarks of 1511. So it was clearly a royal commission, and it's covered with royal badges of red and white roses and pomegranates. And we also know that the lost finial was originally in the form of St. George uh, and the Dragon, just as it was, as, uh, as it is on the Howard Grace Cup. But where did the crystal come from? It's earlier than the mounts, uh, significantly earlier, uh, maybe 200 years earlier. Um, it, they're it is probably Sicilian, and it's very similar in form to a number of hardstone vases that happened to belong to Lorenzo uh, the Magnificent. There is one uh, in the Museo degli Argenti. So it's possible that it came to England as a diplomatic gift from an Italian ruler and perhaps the Pope, and that it was mounted um, after it got here. Don't, don't imagine for a moment uh, that a, a rock crystal vase of the size of that one would in itself not have been an extremely significant gift. In fact, the rock crystal was undoubtedly, at the time it was made, the time the whole object was made, the most valuable part of, of the object by, uh, by a margin. Um, but uh, two significant kinds of gifts were particularly papal. The golden rose and the sword and cap of maintenance. By long-established tradition, each year, the Pope chose a Christian prince to receive one or other of these special tokens of favor. Uh, each served a similar but a dis distinct purpose. The golden rose was dispatched during Lent as a symbol of the coming hope of Easter. And Henry VIII received this exceptional honor not once, but twice. On each occasion, it was received with great solemnity at a special service in St. Paul's. And Edward Hall describes the second of these roses given by Clement VII. And while I'm reading the description, you can look at this image. Um, it was, he says, a tree forged with fine gold and wrought with branches, leaves, and flowers resembling roses. This tree was set in a pot of gold, which had three feet of antique fashion. In the uppermost rose was a fair sapphire, the bigness of an acorn. There is indeed a sapphire um, up there. Uh, the tree was half the height of an English yard, uh, and in breadth it was a foot. Duly received, the rose went off to the jewel house for safekeeping. Needless to say, it doesn't survive. But we do have this very beautiful image of another one from the amazing illustrated inventory of Cardinal Albrecht of Brandenburg's treasures, which was compiled in 1525. And it's, I think you'll agree, a dead ringer for, for Hall's description. So clearly, papal roses were made to a standard design and did not greatly differ from one year to another. The sword and cap of maintenance uh, were blessed by the Pope on Christmas Eve and awarded to a ruler in recognition of his defense of Christianity. Leo X awarded the gift to Henry in 1513, but it didn't reach England until June of the following year. And Nicola di Favri, a member of the Venetian delegation, left a vivid account, account of it in which he says that the weapon was long with a gilded guard and scabbard, and the cap seemed, seemed to be of purple satin covered with embroidery uh, and pearls. Once again, the sword does not survive, but more surprisingly, three others of the period do, including one given to James IV of Scotland, which you can see in the Honours of Scotland uh, in Edinburgh Castle, and, and there it is. Like the rose, it appeared to follow a standard pattern which is Renaissance rather than Gothic, uh, and must have seemed strikingly novel in England at the time. Such gifts were more of symbolic than financial value. Henry's golden rose weighed 19 ounces and would have equated to a bullion value of about 40 pounds. Uh, and Leo X told Henry that the sword was not so valuable for the matter as for the mystery. 
I like that. Not so valuable for the matter as for the mystery. There's one more sort of diplomatic gift that we should consider before turning to my last topic, uh, and that is those given to resident ambassadors at the end of their posting. In contrast to the magnificence of the leaders of extraordinary embassies and their entourages, the life of the resident ambassador was altogether more low-key. Permanent diplomatic representation varied depending on the current relations between the two states, but during the reign of Henry VIII, the most uh, established delegations were those from uh, Venice, France, uh, and Spain, which under Charles V, of course, was the same thing as the empire. Uh, England tended to maintain reciprocal representation at these courts too. Delegations uh, were very small, normally comprising just the ambassador himself, a secretary, and a few servants. They had a fairly hand-to-mouth uh, existence, and in England anyway, they could expect no real gifts until, as I say, they left. That might be uh, after some years, uh, and to a large extent, they depended on the support that they received from their compatriots amongst the uh, merchant community. In 1533, for example, the long-term imperial ambassador to Henry, Eustace Chapuis, got a nasty shock. As he wrote afterwards to Charles V, without knowing how to account for it in the least, fire broke out uh, in one of the towers of my house, containing my plate, wearing apparel, best house furniture, and in short, almost every valuable I possessed uh, in this world. It's almost an irreparable blow to me, who must now be completely ruined in consequence. But, he goes on, I have found no small comfort from the alacrity with which the Spaniards and Germans residing in this city have placed at my disposal more money and silver plate than could be held in one large room. So, it wasn't all bad, it seems. Maybe he set fire to it himself, who knows. <laughs> the, the royal gifts they did eventually receive on departure were very modest compared with those given to the grandees. Uh, these were usually in the form of plate or gold chains, and they were quite standard. The retiring Venetian ambassador, for example, always received a chain, normally to the value of around 500 ducats. Gold chains were a particularly English thing, and when the cream of the English and French nobility met at the field of cloth of gold in 1520, it was their chains that everyone commented on. Uh, here's the uh, youthful Henry at the 1511 tournament, and you can see that all his henchmen, um, the, the, the foot, foot men, as it were, to either side, um, are wearing substantial gold chains around their necks. Now, normally, these gifts were accepted by the ambassador as a perk, but not in the case of Venice, where the recipient would have to petition the state in order to be allowed to re retain it. And these were by no means always successful. And in 1535, returning ambassador Capello failed to secure the required four-fifths majority uh, and had to hand his chain over to the state, which seems a bit harsh to me. Chapuis uh, occasionally grumbled that he never received anything from Henry other than a haunch of venison in 1529. Um, and on one occasion, he was perhaps a little too audible, and the Duke of Norfolk had to take him to one side and tell him that the king commands me to say in his name that you must not think it strange that the, Fren the Flemish ambassadors who have left this court have received the customary presence on departing, whereas you have received none. It's no great fault of the king or of his ministers, but the custom in this country is to give such presents only on parting. An altogether higher level of expectation attended dynastic marriages. These were grandiose uh, statements of supposedly permanent alliance between two states. They involved lengthy and careful negotiations, huge public celebrations, and the commitment of large sums of money in the form of dowries and presents. They were frequently centered on children who were well beneath any conceivable age of consent, and they were the pawns of their parents' political gains. Love had very little to do with it, even though such marriages, given their relatively low level of emotional expectations, 
um, and the obligation of fidelity, uh, were often surprisingly successful. But there were a number of these during the early Tudor period, and several more that never came off at all. Prince Arthur's marriage to Catherine of Aragon is the most famous, but the one I'd like to look at now is that between Henry's younger sister, Mary, showing on the right, uh, and King Louis XII of France. Uh, this was definitely no love match. Louis was ailing and aged. He was 52 years old, and she was 18 and beautiful. A good match for him, but not quite so good for her. <laughs> the wedding took place in France in October 1514 and was preceded, as we've heard um, in other lectures uh, already, uh, by a proxy marriage at Greenwich in August, and bizarrely, a proxy consummation. <laughs> for the Greenwich ceremony, the Duke de Longueville stood proxy for King Louis and was presented for his pains uh, with 2,000 pounds worth of plate and Henry's sumptuous gown. The, in the strange ritual that followed, the Marquis de Rotelin touched the princess with his naked leg and the marriage was declared consummated. <laughs> Mary then embarked for France with a huge entourage and a vast quantity of plate and jewels. One observer wrote that she wore on her neck a jeweled diamond as large and broad as a full-sized finger with a pear-shaped pearl beneath it, which jewel had been sent her by the King of France. The jewelers of the row, that's to say Cheapside, when the king desired to value it, estimated its worth at 60,000 crowns. This jewel was almost certainly the so-called mirror of Naples, which we'll hear more of again in a moment. Mary and her party were grandly received in Paris in a series of splendid pageants. She was also showered with gifts by her doting husband, as is clear from a letter by the Earl of Worcester to Wolsey. Uh, My lord, I assure you, that he hath a marvellous mind to content and please the queen. He showed me the goodliest and richest sight of jewels that I ever saw. And when he showed me all, he said that they all should be for his wife. But merrily laughing, he said, my wife shall not have all at once, but uh, at diverse times, for he would have many and at diverse times kisses and thanks for them. Louis was generous to Mary's es noble escort too, some of which returned to England with gifts of plate amounting to 30,000 francs each. But his sudden death, very soon afterwards, overdoing it I suppose, led to uh, a long series of tetchy negotiations for the uh, return of the dowry. This eventuality had been provided for in the terms of the agreement. It was always a possibility after all and should have been straightforward. But the newly ascended Francis I made difficulties. He proposed returning just half the gold plate, worth 50,000 crowns, and half the jewels, but only on condition that Henry acknowledged that this was not done out of obligation, but as a free gesture of goodwill. He also flatly refused to return the mirror of Naples, which Louis uh, had sent to England as a prenuptial gift, and which Francis claimed should never have left France. This was, of course, a red rag to the uh, Henrician bull, and probably planted that sense of mistrust that informed their relationship for the rest of their lives. It also set in motion a chain of events that are a fascinating story, but not part of this story. To conclude, diplomacy in the modern sense conducted by resident ambassadors was in its infancy in the 16th century. But great embassies, led by grandees of the church or the nobility, had always been a conduit of international relations, and aside from war itself, were an indispensable means of winning friends and influencing people. But they were costly because of the size of the delegations, because of the lavishness of their entertainments, and because of the sheer extravagance uh, of the gifts. This is wallpaper, but uh, to remind you of what such gifts might have looked like. Um, these were expected, these gifts, um, and so not to give them would have been distinctly counterproductive. But they were also a reflection of the doctrine of magnificence, whereby it was de rigueur for a prince not only to dazzle with his own wealth, 
but to be liberal with others too. The presence of foreign ambassadors was an opportunity to enhance his reputation at home and abroad by showing that he was rich, generous, and cultured. But it was also a means through splendid incoming gifts for new styles, technologies, and learning to be transferred from one country to another. Thank you. <laughs>